Welcome to the Bold Story Press publishing webinar. I'm Emily Barras, and I'm the founder of Bold Story Press. I have closer to 40 years of experience in publishing now. Um, 35 of those years were in trade publishing. I'm sorry, we're in traditional publishing. Um, and during that time, I published probably more than a thousand books, um, but hundreds of, of uh, successful books and many of them best-selling books. Uh, during that time, I was an editor, a sales rep, a marketing manager, a publisher, and my last role in traditional publishing was as vice president and editor-in-chief of a division of McGraw-Hill. Publishing today is very different than it was when I was starting out. Uh, when I was starting out, we used these typewriters. Computers were not yet on the scene. The industry was smaller, but there were many more players than there are today. Um, there were small players and medium-sized players, and then, and then the big guys in traditional publishing. And over the course of my career, I saw the big players, the big publishers, um, gobble up the smaller publishers in, and um, that continued until there were just a handful of large publishers left in the United States. And uh, in time, they were also uh, acquired by uh, the European publishers until we reached the point as we are today where there are no US owned large traditional uh, publishers left. Digital books, of course, and um, the computer played a huge role in changing the industry. In a very short amount of time, uh, the majority of book sales have migrated from bookstores to Amazon. 80% of all books are sold on Amazon today. Uh, and um, that, of course, put put bookstores out of business. And there used to be many bookstore chains, and today there is just one left, that's Barnes and Noble. And there used to be many, many more independent bricks and mortar bookstores, and many of them have, have gone bankrupt and uh, disappeared from the scene. And independent bookstores now also do the majority of their book sales online. Um, in addition to the sales from the bricks and mortar stores. If you wanna write and publish a book, I think it's important to think about what your motives are. Uh, I think there's value in that. I've worked with authors with the following motives and found um, many of them to be successful and some of them not, not so successful. The authors I've worked with, some of them have been passionate about their topic. Usually that's been in the nonfiction space with textbooks or um, business books or you know, books about content that the author is expert in. Some authors have described their motivation as having a story inside of them that they needed to get out. They felt compelled to share. And uh, usually that was a, uh, an idea for a story, maybe a plot for a story. Uh, but sometimes authors who had that urge described it as, as having a fully formed story within, and they were channeling the story onto the page. Some authors write to make money, and there are far fewer of those authors today than, than there were 10 years ago or 20 years ago because, because of the sheer numbers of books being published today, it is harder to write um, just to make money. Some authors write to establish themselves as an authority in their field. And I'm talking about entrepreneurs. Many entrepreneurs would tell you that authoring a book is as important as having a business card. That uh, being able to say that you're an author in your field will, um, for many people, give you an instant stamp of credibility, 
or expertise. When people hear you are an author, they don't really know how to judge um, what how successful your book has been. They don't know how to look at rankings on Amazon and and determine if your book has sold many copies. So just hearing that you're an author makes them think immediately that you're an expert. And then some authors write to leave a legacy. And um, we see a good number of memoirs, uh, manuscripts sent to us each year. And they are people who want to capture their story or their family's story for their uh, children and their grandchildren in order to leave a legacy. I think it's important to, to think about for whom you are writing your book, um, who will want your book, who will pay for your book, what do you know about them, and how will you reach them? And I think I've always thought it was important for authors to do this. Um, today, we actually recommend that you get a pretty good idea, an, an avatar, if you will, of your ideal reader. You know, how old are they? What gender are they? What other kinds of books do they read? And having that picture clearly in your mind can help you when you get stuck in the process of writing your book. If you know that your reader um, are women ages 40 to 60 and they read these kinds of books, when you hit um, blocks or uh, points in your story where you're not sure in which direction to go or you're not sure how much detail to add, how many examples or anecdotes, having that clear picture of your reader can help you answer those questions. To become the published author you wish to be, do you need to make any changes to yourself, to your day-to-day -day routine? And I love this quote, I've certainly always found it to be true for myself. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. So if you have been saying for many years that you're going to publish your book, but you haven't changed anything about your day-to-day -day routine in order to um, make writing a part of your, your everyday routine, I think you need to um, think about what the likelihood is that you will be successful in that goal. I also like this quote quite a bit from Marianne Williamson, and especially as it pertains um, to the women I work with, the women authors, and, and in my own experience, this, this quote um, holds true. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. And I, um, I share that because in my experience, and actually if you read the research, perfectionism is an issue that that um, is mostly gender focused and it's mostly women that suffer from perfectionism. And, and that perfectionism will stop us sometimes from putting our work out into the world. We think, oh, I can get this even better or more perfect. And and we don't um, take risks and put our uh, put our work out. And and you have to you have to take that risk if uh, if you want to become a published author because it's impossible to reach perfect. And um, you can't let good enough you know be the the enemy um, of perfection. If I did I say that correctly or did I reverse that? I'm going to talk about the five basic phases of publishing so that you are armed with some knowledge of what the process looks like. Writing, editing, design, 
production and launching your book. When it comes to writing, there is no one writing style that will guarantee your success. I've seen authors, basically I've worked with authors with two basic styles of writing. The first is that they are organized process people. They start with an outline and they put the major headings down for their book, the chapters or parts. And then they go back and, and put in subheadings for each chapter so that they are laying down another layer of detail. Then they write a, a summary of that chapter, um, putting some prose to the organization. And then they flesh out each of those chapters until they've written the whole book, the whole manuscript. Other authors are... Um, less linear, less process driven in their in the way they approach writing. I would put myself in this category and sometimes these writers, this style of writing is called pantsers because we are more inclined to fly by the seat of our pants. And with this style, more often the, the author will sit down and write everything they can think of about their topic um, and download it onto the page. They get all of their ideas, all of their um, characters or character development. They get they they share the the dialogue that they have formed in in their mind, um, the questions that they have yet to resolve, the research that they've done and the research that, that still needs to be done. They download it all onto the page. And then, then they start to work through the this rough draft, winnowing out the content that they know they don't want to keep. And and adding to the content that they do until their manuscript and their story starts to take shape and they keep um, working through the, the, those drafts until the manuscript is as clean and um, as accurate and as um, engaging and well-written as they can get it. I've seen both styles of writing. Um, have success and I've seen both styles fail. So I don't think there is any one style that guarantees success. Um, most of the authors who write have to do some form of research. And certainly that's true for nonfiction writing, but it's also true for fiction writing. If you are writing, if you are placing your novel in another state or city or country, it's important that you do the research so that your facts are accurate. Um, if you make a mistake, a factual error in your writing, in my experience, right, readers will forgive you one, maybe two factual errors, but if you continue to make them, readers will give up on you and um, stop reading. And so it's important that you get your, your facts correct in your writing. Book coaches are a fairly new phenomena in publishing. I'd never heard of a book coach until maybe five or six years ago. I think they've been around longer than that, but I, I've run into two kinds of book coaches with one um, type of book coach. They are trained, skilled, developmental editors who can read your content and give you feedback and hold you accountable um, for deadlines and help you to guide you to a, a finished manuscript. And some book coaches don't have the editorial experience. They, they um, have not worked on tons of manuscripts in their past. And the role they're feeling, feeling is really more as an accountability coach, um, helping authors set goals and meet those goals and turn in the content, but they are less skilled and less able to give you feedback on that content when they read it. Um, again, I've heard of authors who've worked with book coaches with good results and um, some authors who've worked with book coaches who've been disappointed with that experience. It all depends on the coach and the quality 
of the coach that that you find and and that you have clear expectations about how that coach is going to work with you and help you. And then finally, if you want to write and publish a book, but you actually don't want to write it, um, you don't have the skill set to write it and the time to invest in in developing that skill set, then ghostwriters are available. Uh, and if you have the money, because ghostwriters are expensive, that is another option in publishing your story. When it comes to writing, I'm a big proponent of setting a daily writing goal, whether that is an, an amount of time that you will sit at your computer, preferably in the same space, same place every day um, from 7 a.m. until 8.30 a.m. and you will write. And during that time, you are not editing your manuscript. You aren't doing research on your manuscript. You are creating con content. Um, Another way to set da daily goals for yourself instead of a time goal is to say, I'm going to sit down and write a thousand words and, or 5,000 words, and I'm not going to stop or get up from this computer until I've met that goal. But however you set your goals, I think it's important to make sure that that if they're not daily goals, they are they are consistent, regular goals so that you are writing three days a week, every week, day in and day out. If you write, you will have to learn to self-edit. Everybody does um, because it's impossible for content to come out of your brain onto the page perfectly. Um, I've never done it. I've never seen it done. So you will learn to edit your work um, as you go. And it's also critical that you seek objective reviewers for your manuscript, because if you are only sharing your manuscript with friends and loved ones, you are not getting the kind of feedback that, that you likely need in order to make your manuscript stronger. Some friends and loved ones know how to give objective feedback and feel comfortable doing that. But in my experience, friends and loved ones look for the compliments they can give you about the manuscript you've given them. They look for the things that they like and that they feel you're doing right. And that's the feedback they share. They are less comfortable telling you about the issues or the problems that they found in your manuscript. And so you can't, you can't count on loved ones to help you work through all the issues in, in your manuscript. And so it's important to have an editor read your content. I think it's also important to have beta reviewers, um, other writers and um, uh, people in a writing group can be helpful when you share your content with each other and ask for feedback. But, but it's important to get that in the process of creating your content. And then finally, my advice, if you are writing and you wanna publish is to be reading, reading good books already published in your genre. They will help you um, see how it's done. They will help you understand how another writer dealt with um, challenges when they came across them. You can see how other writers lay out the story, how they deal with um, different issues in that come up for every writer in the genre, and um, they will give you ideas and, and uh, show you maybe new vocabulary, whatever. It, I, I find that I'm always learning something from reading other works in my genre. So it's important that you be reading at the same time you're writing. When it comes to editing, there are three basic kinds of editing. Um, developmental editing is the most skilled, the most uh, detailed 
maybe that's not the word I want actually, but developmental editors are reading your manuscript, both you know on a line by line, they're working their way through your manuscript line by line, but they're often reading it from 50 feet up. They are reading for your story arc. They are reading for your plot. Does it make sense? Um, are you creating a sense of tension such that such that your readers are are engaged and they want to keep turning the page? Are you developing your characters um, believably and fully? And do you have a have the right blend, the right mix of likable characters? and bad guys. If all of your characters are awful, um, that affects your reader because readers want to find at least one character they can like um, and root for. Developmental editors will, will um, give you feedback on the line by line basis. And they'll also write in the margins, you know, some of these larger questions. They may give you advice and they may give you suggestions for how they would frame some of the content in the margin. A copy editor is going to read more for grammar and style. A copy editor also reads line by line and they're catching typos and grammatical mistakes. And they're also making sure that your manuscript is following the style manual for the publisher. Almost all trade books or trade book publishers use the Chicago Manual of Style. And it's important that your content is consistently following that style manual. And then a proofreader usually reads the manuscript after it's been typeset and it's now in galleys or pages. And they're reading for any typos or grammatical issues that the copy editor missed. Um, and they're reading for any issues that may have been introduced when the book was typeset, when the manuscript was typeset. Because sometimes in that process of typesetting, the um, typesetter can introduce problems or issues where they didn't exist before in the uh, in the form of spaces where they don't belong. Sometimes they'll accidentally cut off a word or cut off a letter of a word um, in a sentence. So proofreaders are are that last read through to capture and to catch anything that the, that the editorial eyes that came before them missed. Design is part of the process that many of our authors um, enjoy really. Um, planning your cover design can be a fun process. We ask our authors to sit down with the editor and the designer and to talk about the look and feel they want for their book, um, to talk, to bring samples and examples of covers in their genre that they love and covers that they don't like uh, so that they can tell the designer, uh, show the designer why. Um, and then once once the designer is has all of that information, they go off and they make uh, three or four cover designs, and they come back and share those designs with the author. And then the author uh, takes those designs and identifies the things that they like about those designs and and the designer you know works with that feedback to create that perfect design. Then the designer creates the interior book design, which for most trade books, you know, most trade books are black and white. Um, with no photographs or art. And so that's a pretty simple interior design, but you still have to choose the fonts for your content and your chapter openers need some kind of um, design treatment and your part openers and your front matters. So all of these elements are um, designed by your, by your designer after the cover has been designed. And then finally, if you do have an art program, if you do have photographs or, or line drawings or um, illustrations, the designer will work with you to make sure that they are of the quality that they need to be in order to print well. And they will uh, determine where those images are placed 
in the content on the page so that it makes best sense. Production is the big umbrella um, bucket that, that holds everything that happens from the minute we say that the manuscript is final, the editors are done until the book is published. And so that includes choosing your trim size, um, determining what, what kind of binding you're gonna use. Are you gonna have a paperback book? Are you going to have a hardbound book? Do you want a cloth binding with a jacket? Um, do you want a laminate hardcover? Are you going to have an ebook, an audio book? All of those decisions are made in the production process. You'll have to choose the, the kind of paper you're using. Will it be 50 pound paper or 70 pound paper? Will it be white or cream? Um, you'll have to do your metadata research. And there's, there's a good deal involved in that that authors sometimes don't realize. Um, you'll have to get your ISBNs and register your copyright and register your book with the Library of Congress. So there are a number of uh, decisions to be made and work to be done that's done in the production process. And if you choose to self-publish, you will need to educate yourself about these um, decisions. And there is enough information out there on Google and on the internet for you to do that, to, to um, educate yourself so that you can self-publish, you just have to do that work. Um, of course, if you're working with a publisher, the production manager is going to be expert in these decisions and they are gonna make these decisions with you and, and explain these decisions to you so that your book is, is um, published in the best possible format. Um, in order to, to drive success of your book. And then after you've, you've gone through the production process, um, usually we do advanced reader copies for our authors. And at that point we stop the production process so that the marketing and promotion can begin. Um, sometimes we stop at that advanced reader stage um, for 16 weeks, if that's what the author or the publicist um, wants. And sometimes the promotion phase is much shorter than that. But during that, during the um, that process, the author is promoting and marketing their book. And uh, you will want to create a book launch team and bring as many family, friends, um, uh, people who are willing to help you into your network so that your reach with your book is not just your own network, but it is the network of all of those folks on your book launch team. You'll want to develop a plan, a, a marketing strategy and create a marketing calendar so that you are getting the word out about your book um, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And then you're going to be getting reviews, as many as you possibly can, um, some from book review sites that are important that will help you drive success. You're going to be shooting for 50 Amazon reviews as quickly as you can get them because that will help you on Amazon with the Amazon algorithms. And you're going to be getting reviews on Goodreads and other book sites in order to drive um, sales of your book. There are three basic types of publishing that I'm, I'm going to review for you pretty quickly, just to give you an idea of what your options are when it comes to publishing a book. Most people think when they think of publishing, they think of traditional publishers the big five, um, and they think that that's the only way to publish a book. When I was starting out as an editorial assistant, um, I had a friend, also an editorial assistant, and I stayed on the nonfiction side of publishing. She went to um, HarperCollins and worked on in the children's list and young adult list. 
And she worked her way up and became editor in chief of that list at HarperCollins. And she told me that it was um, 25 years ago, maybe more, when trade publishers were um, receiving 35,000 unsolicited manuscripts a year, and they simply could not keep up with the volume of manuscripts that they were receiving. And it was at that point that they realized that they needed a gatekeeper between themselves and the writing public. And so they made the decision that uh, agents would be those gatekeepers for them and that they would not accept any manuscripts for review unless it came in through an agent. And all of the major publishers pretty quickly followed suit. And so today you must have an agent if you wanna be considered by a traditional publisher. A traditional publisher, usually the business model looks like this. Um, if you are lucky as a new first time author, you will receive an offer and you will um, be given some small advance. Usually if you're unknown, that advance is gonna be closer to $5,000 um, than than hundreds of thousands of dollars. That advance is not a gift. It is an interest-free loan. Um, you will, the publisher will recover that money from you, from the royalties before they start to pay out your share of the royalties. The traditional publisher will pay for your designers and pay for your editors and pay all the costs associated with publishing your book. And then when the book is published, they will recover some of those costs and, um, and then they will start to pay royalty um, to the author. And most beginning authors will receive 10% of the profit from the publisher. And so um, they pay everything up front and you receive about 10% of the profits. With self-publishing, of course, you pay all of the expenses yourself. You find your own editors and your own designers, and you educate yourself about the process. And then when the book publishes, you receive all of the royalties. Um, and hybrid publishing, which is what Bold Story Press is, uh, we are we have a foot in both worlds in the sense that it... Um, our team is, is made up of all experienced uh, traditional publishing people. So all of our designers, all of our editors, all of our production managers worked for many, many years in the traditional publishing business. And so your, your book is uh, published in a professional way so that the trade markets um, recognize your book as professionally published. But when it comes to um, royalty and sharing the profit, we ask our authors to pay a flat fee up front to share in the risk of, of publishing. With traditional publishing, it's almost a form of gambling. The reason they keep 90% of the profit is because only about 15 or 20% of their books actually hit their sales numbers. And that means that the 80% don't make their sales numbers. So those 20% of their books have to underwrite the profit of the whole program. And so that's why um, they are keeping 90% of the, of the profit. With hybrid publishing, you're paying that flat fee up front and you are receiving the majority of the royalties. At Bold Story Press, we pay our authors 60% of the print um, royalties and 70% of the ebook and audiobook royalties. But you're sharing in the risk by paying some money up front. Um, and, um, and with hybrid publishing, you are usually printing the, the books are distributed through the major book distributors, but um, print on demand instead of underwriting the cost of a big print run up front and then having to pay for the warehousing um, of those books. Good hybrid publishers are, are curated um, publishers. Their, their lists are curated 
we don't at Bold Story Press, we reject about 70% of the manuscripts we receive. Um, and that's also what differentiates us from this last category, the editorial service providers. Really, they are vanity presses. And, and uh, what happens with editorial service providers is they'll publish any book if you have the money. And so being published by them isn't really um, any endorsement of the quality of your book, but rather that, that you had the money in order to hire um, a, a vanity press. And their editors and designers tend to be, because of the volume of people they work with, they um, can't always vouch for the quality of those people. And so sometimes the, the professionals that you're paired with, um, that process is a little hit, hit or miss. You may get a good editor and you may not. So there's more risk attached to working with editorial service providers. And that's really what, um, what your options are for publishing. Those who tell the stories rule the world. I believe that. Um, if you are on social media, I hope you'll like us or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And that is the presentation. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions for you now. If you want to take yourself off mute, um, I'm happy to talk about anything you'd like to talk about. Who has a question? No question? I'm curious oh. about, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Curious about um, what you need in terms of a proposal. And also when you said that there is a flat fee, does that depend on the book or is it a standard amount that, that writers pay? Um, so at Bold Story Press, we charge $10,000 up front. It, um, that number can change if the book is much smaller than your standard trade book or um, if it needs developmental editing because we cover um, the copy editing or and or proofreading, but we do not cover the developmental editing. And so if you need that, we charge $50 an hour for that, which is a very reasonable price. Um, so that's how we do it. There are hybrid publishers out there that will charge up to $30,000 up front. Um, uh, so, you know, it depends on, on the publisher. And in terms of the proposal, we outline on our submissions page what, what we're looking for, but basically that document is, is an overview of the market. Um, what segment of the market you know you're aiming for so that we can kind of put the book in context when we're reading your chapters um we want to know what your reach is do you have a community of people who are waiting for your book you know do you have any um or are you starting from fresh you know from scratch uh, that the day you publish is um uh you're starting from ground zero in terms of building a following and building a market. Um, so we're looking for uh, that kind of information in, in the proposal. And then we generally like to have three, at least three chapters that we will read. Um, and if you send the whole manuscript, we actually, our editors who do the reading will dip in and out of of the manuscript. Sometimes they'll want to check to see what you do with the ending or um, they may want to see how an issue is resolved. So, so that's generally what, what we ask for. Okay. And you skip the agent as middle person. You don't, we care. don't work with agents. And the other thing that most authors don't know is that you are paying the agent. It's coming out of your share of the profit, but that's not what it feels like. Like it feels like the, the publisher is paying the agent. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't work with agents.
I have a question. Yes, Janet. You mentioned metadata research and you sort of skimmed over it quickly and, and I don't know what it is. Okay, so metadata research, I, when I, yeah, I mean, not surprisingly, when I decided to start this publishing company, even though I had been a um, an editor in chief at McGraw Hill, you know, with a list of we saw we published five hundred books a year on my list, I thought I knew publishing pretty well. Well, when I started this little trade publisher, I found out how much you know I didn't know because there were thousands of people in our organization who were doing that work. Um, for us. And, and, um, and so when I started out, metadata research was one of the, the areas where I spent a lot of time doing a lot of research and we hired some consultants to teach us some things. And it's, it's interesting and, and pretty sophisticated. And basically what it, what you're doing with the metadata research is you're maximizing your, um, uh, presence on Amazon. If you're not successful on Amazon because 80% of books are sold on Amazon, then chances are that you're not going to be successful. And so it's very important that you um, understand how the algorithms work on Amazon because there are 2 million books being published every year. The huge majority of them are people who are taking word files and uploading them to KDP and self-publishing. And that, but that means that that's 8,000 new books a day. And so the sheer amount of data in Amazon is staggering. You know, it's um and um, understanding the algorithms and how to to um, reach the people who will be interested in reading your book can make you or break you. And that's what metadata is basically. And so that means that you have to be in the right categories within Amazon because a Amazon ranks success for books based on their categories. And so um, if you've done a, a stained glass um, book, how to make stained glass, you are not going to be under general fiction. You're going to be under a much smaller category, um, under artistic, uh, you know, hands-on, blah, blah, blah. You're going to find the smallest possible category and you are going to um, attempt to be the most successful book in that category. Because when you are, Amazon bumps you up in their algorithms and they start to help you promote the book by showing ads for people who are doing searches on stained glass books. Um, we then we then go out and look at who are the best selling books in stained glass. And we go in and we read the reviews for those books. It's, it's not that we want to read the reviews from Publishers Weekly or Kirkus. We want to read the reviews from users, from people who are actually buying stained glass books, because we want to see what language they're using in their reviews because that's the same language they use when they do a search for new books in their area. And we wanna make sure that we've captured each of those words in our keywords and are using them on your author page and when describing your book. Because again, Amazon's algorithms picks up those keywords and they're bumping you up to the top in searches, which will have a huge impact you know, on your sales success. Does this that make is sense? Fiction as well. Pardon? This is true for fiction as well. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine 8,000 new books a day. <laughs> it's, it's oh. Yeah. So it can get pretty sophisticated, like the algorithms like images. And so we... We work with our authors to make sure we've got at least five or six images on the page. I don't know if you've ever been on Amazon and seen, sometimes there will be a, a chart that show, that compares three products and you know it doesn't really say one's better than the other. Well, that's because all three products were the um, 
the person who has the pay job is own owns all three products. So they're not trying to push you in one direction or another, but by putting images of all three products, they've made the algorithm happy because the algorithm wants images. They want anything that will keep a, a, a potential buyer on your page longer. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty sophisticated. You said that you reject about 70%. So I'm just curious to know what sorts of books you're looking for. What, which, can you categorize the ones that really work for you? Uh, yeah, we, we don't publish poetry um, be, largely because we don't really know how to edit poetry. Um, you know, poetry is so, you change the meaning, right? By changing one word in poetry and and you don't wanna do that. And so um, we, if you wanna publish poetry, we think you should be publishing with, with a publisher who is expert in, po in poetry. So we don't publish there and we don't publish children's picture books. Um, again, that's in genre, an area that requires a good deal of expertise um, and a good deal of investment, to be honest. And it's a relatively small number of books that have success in, in a very glutted market. We love children's paragraph books, um, but but not the picture books. And, and then after that, um, we don't we don't want to publish anything that is dark or violent or um if we don't think it adds some value to the world either in the form of entertainment or um you know the messaging is uplifting in some way it's not a good match for our list and then it comes down to the quality of the writing so if we if we think that your manuscript is pretty good and with the help of our editors we can get it to the level of quality that that we require we'll make you an offer if we don't think we can get it there then then we reject it and that is usually the reason we are rejecting how do you um how does it work when you you uh, someone submits a book and you evaluate it and and at what point is money exchanged? Um, you submit the book, we evaluate it. If we're going to make you an offer, um, we do. And then, you know, we offer you a contract. And then you, you once you've signed the contract, you are paying us in, in three or four installments at the beginning of the process. Um, and usually over a period of three or four uh, months actually. And so that takes you well into the process, usually um, well into the production part of the process. You've gone through the editorial part and usually the design part. Um, so that's what it looks like. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> Other questions? So we offer, um, if, if you would, if you have questions that you don't wanna ask in this group, or if you'd like to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, um, we follow up with an email, thanking you for coming, asking you to do a, a little review of this for us, um, the webinar for us, but um, we'll schedule a call, a short call with you if, if you would like to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, to answer any questions. And so if you, if that would be helpful, I encourage you to take us up on that offer. Okay, if there are no other questions, well, thank you for coming. I hope thank this you. was thank useful. You. Thanks so much for organizing this. Really appreciate it. Sure.